Hi ladies and gentlemen, my name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 58 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. Uh, we're delighted today to have with us uh, CEO of Safe Food 360, George Howlett. Uh, very special guest. Uh, Safe Food 360 have been a kind sponsor of their IFSQN for many years and uh, it's great to have George with us today. George is going to be talking about risk assessment under BRC. There's lots of demands for risk assessments within uh, all the GFSI standards, but how to do that? Uh, so George is going to give us some uh, tips on that. Uh, just to say, uh, this uh, webinar program that brings you free education each week uh, is sponsored by, as I said, Safe Food 360 and also the other kind of sponsors, Metla Toledo, FSSC 22000 and Trace Analytics. So that allows you to get some free education and a free certificate of attendance every week. So that's fantastic. Uh, just to say, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, lots of people ask all the way through. It's being recorded, so if you have to nip away or have a few technical problems, don't worry. Within 24 hours, we'll send all registrants an email with the slides, the webinar recording, and everything you need. Uh, if you do struggle with the uh, connection today, obviously we're live streaming here, so it relies on my internet connection, uh, George's internet connection, and all you hundreds of people all over the world. So uh, if the majority can see and hear okay and you cannot, then it could be your connection. Okay, right, um, George, how are you doing? Nice to have you with us today. I'm great, Simon. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, looking forward to it. Good, and where are you dialing in from, George, today? Uh, dialing in from rainy Dublin in Ireland. Is it actually raining? Oh, dear. Well, I'm rainy Manchester. I'm from rainy Manchester, and uh, it's, it's not rained for about a month there, which is very surprising. So, okay, while you get your slides ready, I'll just talk to the audience about next the next webinar. Um, okay, the next one, let me just load it in the sidebar for you, um, is... Becoming a food fraud detective with Ruth Bell. Uh, Ruth presented uh, many times at Food Safety Fridays and also at the Food Safety Live conference earlier this year. She's a very good presenter. Um, so that should be good. Uh, November the 4th. Uh, the reason for the bit of a gap is I'm going on vacation for a couple of weeks, uh, having a well-earned rest. So I'll come back hopefully with a suntan looking a, a little bit less tired and refreshed and uh, we'll uh, get into food fraud with Ruth. If you can get your slides up, uh, George, on the um, slide share, that would be great. Um, yeah, so food fraud detective, if you click register now in the sidebar, it'll open a new window, so you won't be taken away, and you can just click register, uh, and just email a name, and away you go. Uh, right, uh, over to George shortly. Um, just to say, please feel free to type your questions and comments in the sidebar. Uh, we'll leave George to do his presentation, and at the end, we'll pick up those questions and we'll have, a, uh, hopefully, some good uh, stimulating uh, interaction. Okay, so I'll be back shortly, but for now, over to George. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it. Uh, so, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for taking the time to join the webinar. Uh, the subject of today's uh, presentation is specifically around risk assessments and uh, how the BRC standards issue 7 uh, places this demand on companies certified to risk assess uh, well, virtually uh, everything that moves these days. And uh, uh, we're going to just talk a bit about HACCP and what they require there. but. More importantly, guys, we're going to speak about those other areas of the BRC standard that uh, would seem to require some sort of uh, risk assessment. Uh, seems to be an area where people can just get a little bit confused, uh, struggle a little bit, uh, and it's no surprise because uh, we really have um, not that much guidance on how to do risk assessments. So what we're going to try to do today, guys, is to uh, uh, kind of... Uh, you know, unmuddy the waters a little bit, uh, talk about some methods and some models that can be used to do all the risk assessments that you um, are kind of obliged to do under the BRC. Okay, so before we kind of get into the BRC uh, specifically, uh, I think it may be no harm to talk a little bit about risk assessment itself. Uh, so just a couple of slides here, guys, 
just to set the scene, so what is, in fact, risk assessment? Now, it's a term that we use almost daily in food safety, but uh, I think a lot of us can use it all, almost without the full understanding of what exactly it is. But in general, it's, um, it is a process or a tool for identifying those hazards, those food safety hazards, which may potentially cause some harm and estimating that risk, just putting a measure on it. And that kind of helps us and informs us about what kind of decisions we may need to make about controlling that hazard. So it is a widely used term. And in general, there are two types of risk assessments we can do in food safety. The, the first of them is what we call a quantitative risk assessment. And the other is a qualitative risk assessment. So just to give you a quick example of what a quantitative assessment might look like, it's very, very specific. So you may determine that uh, one death per year can occur in a given population from, say, salmonella in poultry products, for example. That's very, very detailed and normally not done by food companies. You know, we don't have the time nor the resources to do such a detailed assessment of risk. Normally, governments, state agencies, international bodies who have the wherewithal and the time and the expertise will do that type of risk assessment. But for the rest of us uh, in the food industry, we normally restrict our assessments to what we call qualitative risk assessments. And we, we kind of express it, express it in a general terms such as, well, you know, this is a high risk issue, a medium risk or low risk issue. Uh, the risk framework itself, uh, there's kind of two main elements to risk when it comes to food safety. Uh, first is risk assessment, and, and that really, guys, really involves collecting information and data, you know, and using that data to decide whether something is a high risk or medium risk issue. And the reason we do that is because, you know, uh, resources are limited. There isn't, an, you know, an infinite amount of resources in food businesses. And by doing this risk assessment, we can separate high-risk issues from low-risk issues. And that allows us to make some decisions about how we manage these risks. And that's the key function, the key purpose of risk within the framework. Now, guys, there is a third element. It's risk communication. But I think for the purposes of today's presentation, we don't necessarily need to get into that particular element of it. Um, just at a very high level, there are standard steps in doing a risk assessment. I'm not going to go through them now, guys. Just want to show you uh, what they are. And the first of them is hazard identification. So actually identifying the hazards that we're interested in. And that could be salmonella, it could be E. coli, it could be glass in the products. It doesn't really matter. As long as we can identify it and say this is a hazard. Next step is what we call characterization, and that's telling the story about that hazard. You know, so this is salmonella, it likes to grow at a certain temperature, uh, it likes these kind of foods. If a consumer does you know, get exposed to, the, to this pathogen, what's the outcome? You know, how sick will they get? How soon will it be before they get sick? And so on. So we're characterizing it, we're describing it, we're telling a story. Next uh, element is what's called exposure assessment. And that's really just assessing the likelihood that the hazard will get into the food through whatever means. It could be the raw material. It could be uh, particular steps in the process. It could be food handlers. And then the last and final step is what's called risk characterization. And that, guys, is really just you know, expressing the risk, taking all the previous information and data, and describing that what the risk is. Is it high, is it medium, or is it low? So for anybody who is working in the food industry, uh, as I said, you, you'll be very familiar with risk assessment, uh, certainly with the term. And we have seen over recent times a proliferation of the amount of risk assessments that need to be conducted. Just made a very short list there, guys, top of my head list on those types of risk assessments. HACCP being the obvious one. Most of us will be experienced in conducting a HACCP study. But there are others, uh, such as vulnerability assessments, or VAs, uh, threat analysis, critical control point, or TASAP, preventative control plans in the US now under FISMA, PCP plans, uh, food defense plans as well, which, again, 
uh, kind of fall under the uh, requirements of the Food Safety Modernization Act in the US. There are many, many others, guys. These are, this is just a sample list, but just give you a picture of the increasing application of risk assessment when it comes to food safety. So at the very, very simple level, what is risk? Well, in the context of food safety, it's, 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 it's combining two factors together. So the first of those is probability. So what we mean by that is just the likelihood or the frequency that the hazard potentially could end up in the food product. So for example, how likely is salmonella to be present in raw poultry? You could estimate that as being 5% you know, of you know, prevalence or high, um, whichever one, whichever measure suits your particular approach. Now, the other factor that needs to be considered is what we call severity. So on the assumption that the hazard is present, how, what will be the impact of that on the consumer in terms of severity of impact? So that could be anything from, well, you know, a mild tummy bug uh, right up to hospitalization and more severe um, outcomes. So when you combine those two, or at a very basic level, multiply those together, this gives you a measure of the risk involved. Guys, let's take a closer look now at the BRC uh, and specifically issue seven. So look, most of you who are BRC certified, well, at this stage, all of you will be issue seven certified. And I'm going to make a very general comment. Uh, and that comment is going to be that the BRC likes risk assessment. And I'd even go as far as to say as they love it. And, and I say that for a very specific reason we'll come to in a moment. But the BRC themselves, they um, define risk as the likelihood of occurrence of harm from a hazard. And that is a very valid definition, but not necessarily correct in terms of how the BRC itself expects you to conduct risk assessment. And I'm going to show you why that's the case in a moment. So why do the BRC love us? Well, um, I'm going to use a very simple uh, statistic, and that is that the BRC in the standard itself, referred to the use of risk assessment no less than 97 times. So, um, yes, I have to admit, I've actually taken the time to count those uh, references in the standard. And you can see that it is quite a significant requirement, risk assessment for BRC. Now, when you actually look at those figures in a bit more detail, what we find is BRC require you to in a very clear sense, to document those risk assessments on 14 separate occasions. On 20 uh, other references, it's kind of implied that the risk assessment should be documented, but not clearly so. And then the rest of the, the references are very general. It's not clear at all how the BRC wants you to approach risk assessment. So to give an example of you know, how unclear it can be uh, within the standard itself, uh, this, I've extracted some quotes. So the BRC in places will say to you, the scope and frequency of a system, let's say calibration, shall be established in relation to the risks. Okay, so that's fine. I mean, it, it does kind of suggest that you need to do a risk assessment. Uh, it also will state elsewhere, the frequency of these inspections should be based upon risk company shall undertake a documented risk assessment. So here, guys, we can clearly see a difference in language. The third, um, that third example states very clearly that there must be a documented risk assessment, while the previous two are a little bit more general. Um, just some more quotes. Uh, risk assessment should be, uh, the system should be dependent upon risk assessment at a predetermined frequency based on risk assessment. So these are more quotes. Eliminate potential risks to product safety. Uh, minimize the risk according to risk and the site shall carry out an assessment of risk and so on. So the reason I'm showing those guys is basically to give you a good sense of the different language and approach which the BRC takes in regards to risk. And we can ask some general questions. Does the BRC require us to document and uh, have a structured risk assessment or not? And that's not always clear. So, for example, what's the difference between 
when the standard says the company shall undertake a documented risk assessment and when the standard says the site shall carry out an assessment. So that's not, uh, it's not always quite clear what the expectation is. And why is this question important? Well, it's important because if your auditor comes in and reads it in such a way that they expect to see a document and you don't have it, you know, well, you know that could lead to non-conformance. And the BRC at the moment don't provide a huge amount of guidance on this. So the standard, just to summarize, operates at two levels. It seems to operate on a definite required level, a very clear requirement for risk assessment to be documented. And then it operates on what I'm calling an applied level. So statements such as should be based on risk does suggest the fact that you didn't need to do a risk assessment but not necessarily a documented or structured risk assessment. That's, so it's down to interpretation, essentially. As right, so the next few slides, I'm not going to go through, obviously, in detail, but what we have done here, and when you get a copy of this slide deck, you, you can spend a little bit more time going through this. But what we've done is we've extracted from the standard itself areas where there's a clear requirement for a documented risk assessment. So you can see in the slide, we have the clause number, the requirements, and on the right-hand side, then it states clearly whether or not a documented RA is required, or whether there's an implied risk assessment. Okay, so it's just a useful reference, guys. I think if you know if you are BRC certified and you want to take a closer look at the risk assessment requirements, this will be quite useful. Okay, so for example, we can just to jump back here a little bit. We can see for HACCP. As expected, there's a very clear requirement to document your risk assessments. Definitely, if it's not done, your auditor will be totally justified in raising a non-conformance against you on that. Then moving down through the standard, so we can see, for example, under, say, areas such as uh, corrective preventative actions, it does say that there should be an assessment of the consequences of the outcome of a particular issue. And that does imply that there should be some sort of risk assessment that is documented. Okay, now, just to move on then um, and talk about HACCP a little bit. I think it's very, very clear um, for those of us who worked in the industry over many years that risk assessment you know, has been a pretty standard element of HACCP um, going back to the early days of the Codex principles. So it's well defined. Uh, most of us are used to it. Uh, the use of a simple matrix which has that probability by severity, calculating the figure outs and, uh, and determining if there's a critical control point. But in the case of HACCP, uh, it's very clear that what we focus on is a particular process step and a particular hazard. However, when we come to kind of operational and more general prerequisite programs, this traditional approach of taking a specific hazard, figuring out if it will be in the products and then what the outcome will be, that kind of approach tends to break down when we start to look at sort of prerequisite programs such as pest control, um, calibration systems, internal auditing programs, for example. And because in these cases, the focus is more on the activity rather than the specific hazard. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about this concept in a few slides, because it is key to understanding how to risk assess non-HACCP related systems. And it does cause a massive amount of confusion uh, with risk assessors in the industry. So I'm going to introduce the concept of what we call intrinsic uh, versus kind of inherited risk. So let me explain a little bit more about that. So, our traditional risk assessments and HACCP plans, as I said previously, focus on a specific hazard at a particular step. So let's say we take salmonella at a particular step, say cooking of that product. So there's a clear line between the hazard and the risk, and it's intrinsic to the product. So we know, for example, that salmonella is an intrinsic hazard which affects the risk of the product. Now, for the prerequisite programs, the focus is on more the, the, the likelihood that the program will fail or the, the particular activity will fail. 
And in this case, the risk is inherit, inherited from the, um, the intrinsic risk of the HACCP. So it's more uh, related to what we call failure mode effect analysis. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this particular type of model, uh, but it's not normally used in the food industry, albeit HACCP did emerge from this approach. And let me explain to you in a little bit more detail what that means. So we're going to have an example here. Let's say we take, um, for example, a cooked meat product, which is ready to eat. And we take the cooking step in your process. So the hazard, we can say, is E. coli 0157, a known hazard in relation to certain raw meat products. Probability in this case is the, you know, the likelihood of survival of this pathogen at the cooking step, you know, depending on the time and temperature profile. And we could rate that probably at medium probability. Severity of impact, in other words, if this pathogen was to survive, we can say, again, reasonably, that the impact can be very high on certain um, risk groups, consumers. So combine those two together, we can say that E. coli, a cooking stage for a raw meat product, we can give this a high risk rating. Our control measures, then our temperature and time control of the core product. So this is a clear example of how the, a line can be drawn between the hazard identification, the risk assessment, and its management. And this is something we're all used to when we're doing our HACCP plans. Straightforward and uh, nothing too difficult in that. But when it comes to risk assessing, say, a program, like a PRP, for example, like calibration, this approach tends to break down a little bit. And so let's, let's, let, let's uh, talk through this example. We have a cooking stage, again, for a raw meat product, RTE. Um, and the prerequisite program that we want to risk assess is calibration, which the BRC requires you to do. So we have a device, which is a temperature probe. Our prerequisite program is calibration. And the probability now, so we're looking at probability and severity. Probability in this case moves away from determining the probability or likelihood of the hazard being present E. coli, more to what's the probability of the calibration system itself failing. In other words, that temperature probe not uh, reading correctly the temperature and time. So hopefully that's clear, guys, when we start to see the difference. So the probability of the calibration or the probing out of calibration focuses more on an event that may happen rather than the presence of a particular pathogen. Severity of impact then um, is, we can say, is high because that's inherited from the HACCP risk assessment. So if E. coli is in the product as a result of poorly or a failed calibration on the probe, then we say severity of impact is high. So the control in this case then is the calibration program. We need to determine the frequency of the calibration of that probe based on the risk. So again, just to re reiterate the point guys, in this particular case, the risk assessment is based more on the FMEA approach. And this is the key difference for everybody to kind of get their head around and to understand. So what's the probability of a failed calibration status combined with the inherent risk of E. coli for the consumer. Okay, so taking that, guys, and taking that understanding and the, the difference between assessing kind of HACCP, risk assessment and HACCP, and then risk assessment in other control programs, uh, we can start to build a model or a tool to assess that. So we're we're going to actually provide you with a model, and, and guys, if this is an Excel workbook, which is available off our website, and I'll give you the address later on at the end of the presentation. So we need clear models for assessing non hacap related systems. And these systems under BRC can include, for example, the internal audit program, you must risk assess it, calibration, cleaning programs, pest control, operational PRPs like metal detection, packaging materials, VAs. And the list is much longer than that, but you get the picture. So let's take an example. Let's take internal auditing programs. So the BRC says very clearly, the scope and frequency of audits should be established in relation to the risks. So here 
it's very clear that what we're trying to determine is the failure of the audit program rather than some specific hazard. Okay, so a risk assessment in terms of interpretation should be conducted on each audit program and this will determine how often you need to audit that particular area and this should be documented. And guys, here's a screen grab of the uh, Excel tool that can be used and I'm going to talk you through it in, uh, in relevance to the example of internal auditing. Okay, so on this model, the first thing we want to do is to define for internal auditing a risk matrix. So I'm just going to extract from this screen grab the specific area which on the left hand side is the risk matrix. Okay, so it's very simple. Uh, we're all very familiar with these types of ma uh, matrices. At the top we have probability and we have ratings of 1, 2 and 3. And on the left we have severity, ratings 1, 2 and 3. And multiplying and combining them together will give us our risk assessment. Color coded guys, again, very similar to what you would do in ASAP. We have low risk in green, medium risk in amber and in high risk in red. So, so for each of these assessment uh, models, you should define, and this is a suggested matrix in this case. So what do those figures mean? So when we say probability of one, two, and three, the next step is for us to define exactly what that means. Now remember, we're talking here about risk assessing internal audit programs. So the probability um, for internal auditing, uh, for one, you can see we're stating there is the failure of the, of the activity being audited is unlikely to happen, rare or remote. Number two is the failure of the activity being audited can happen, but not that frequently. And then three, the value of three, is the failure of activity being audited is likely to happen often or frequently. So let's say, for example, where the auditing program covers um, CCPs, for example. In that case, a failure of what you're auditing, i.e. the CCP, you know, would be probably rated as three as being high. Next thing we need to do is to deter, uh, just determine what the values for severity are. And again, you can see there now, number three, failure of activity being audited is likely to lead to an immediate or grave health impact we call or regulatory issue. Now remember, you can define these in whatever way uh, best suits you. These are just purely examples. Okay. Now finally, uh, and impo most importantly, is if you do get a high, medium or low rating of risk, you should define what should happen as a result of that. So let's say we have rated a particular audit uh, program as being high, then you can say, well, look, this should be audited at a very frequent level, a minimum every three months. And your CCP could be a good example of that. If it's low, the audit, the activity should be performed at a minimum level. And that's, let's say, for example, once every 12 months. And that could be a very min minor system or activity in your food safety management system. Okay, so guys, so there, just to go back, and uh, there are all the high level elements in your risk assessment model so far. Okay. Now the next step is to list all the various audit programs in your food safety management system. Now that's a simple, you know, in the case of BRC, you can just simply list out all the clauses of your BRC standard, which you do have to audit. Um, according to the standard itself. So you just list them out. I've just provided an example of a tree there. And you can simply describe what the activity is and describe the risk. And on the right hand side then you can do your measurement of probability and severity, get your risk value and your risk rating. So we can see in these cases that for example for the senior management commitment um, We've rated that as low, and that, in that case, we know should be audited once per year. But we move on to the HACCP plan, and that has to be audited, obviously. Um, but we're saying, well, look, if HACCP system fails, well, that is significant, and uh, we're going to rate that as high. 
and therefore should be audited on a more frequent basis, say every three months, and so on. Uh, housekeeping and hygiene, uh, rated as medium, and that will be audited, say, once every six months. The point here, guys, is that you're, you're conducting a very structured approach to assessing the risk of these systems and defining what the control measure and output should be. Something very, very useful in the context of an audit when your auditors go looking for us. So here's the outcomes for the frequency of audit activity. And now we've complied with the BRC requirement to establish frequency of audits based on an assessment of risk. So just to mention again, guys, we will provide that link to the workbook. And in that workbook, we provide models for pest control, for calibration, for material assessment, and a whole range of other prerequisite programs. So you, you can simply download it and get to work. We, we give you a good head start on the Excel workbook. Now, just the final, um, final bit of the puzzle is a case study. So because I think it's important that we just don't simply do these assessments for the sake of it, uh, simply to comply the requirements of an auditor. Uh, we should actually do them because they, they help us run a more efficient food business. And one great example of that is cleaning programs. So cleaning, as we all know, it's a resource intensive activity. Um, the tendency can be to clean virtually everything that moves from fear that you may, something may go wrong. And that's okay, but not always the most smartest way of actually using your internal resources. So risk assessment is ideal for helping you use those resources effectively and focusing on areas where risk is significant. So I'm going to just talk you through a case study uh, of a company that we worked with um, using this kind of approach. So just some background, uh, the company is a multinational meat packing business, um, has seven operations globally. Um, and are certified and aligned with a number of major retailers and BRC certified as well. Highly automated packing operation and processing operation, and they are specialists in meat production into the food supply chain. So the objective of the, um, the project was to risk assess all the cleaning programs and to determine from this which programs and cleaning activities, if they were to fail, presented the highest risk. And the reason they wanted to do this was they wanted to focus their resources, energy and time more on those activities and then reduce the cleaning frequencies for other less important or less significant cleaning jobs. I think that's something that every food business would aspire to achieve that position. And that has to be based on science and on risk assessment methodology. Okay, guys, I'm just going to jump back to the BRC standard and I'll talk about clause 4.11. That states, the frequency and methods of cleaning shall be based on risk. Now, guys, important to point out here, it doesn't state that you must do a documented risk assessment, but it is implied, and all things being equal, I think you're better off doing it in a documented way. So taking the model that we just previously used, we have our risk assessment matrix, three by three. We've defined what the criteria for each uh, measurement is. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm just going to select the probability number three. And what we're saying here is that the failure of the cleaning activity is likely to happen often and frequent. So what we're saying there is this could be a cleaning job where you know some difficult to clean areas on the production line and for that reason we're saying it's more likely that the cleaning activity might fail. And severity of impact again it follows the intrinsic risk from HACCP you know if a pathogen such as salmonella was to not be removed from the line then obviously the, the impact of that could be significant. But just on the probability end, you can see number one there, We've, we're defining number one as failure of the cleaning activity to happen, rare or remote. So this is really useful to help us to predefine our, our understanding and assessment of the risk. 
Okay, so again, moving on, we defined what the output of a risk assessment is. So if we think activity is high risk, then what we say is the cleaning um, should be frequent. It should be between products with full verification, such as visual, ATP, um, micro testing or chemical testing. On the other hand, if we determine that cleaning activity is low risk, then we can clean it at a minimum level and simply rely upon visual verification to release that cleaning activity. So hopefully you can start to see that, you know, the, the graduation of the outcomes and the actions that are taken. By doing that, guys, we're able to measure the impact of the um, control measure in reducing the risk, which I won't go into too much detail here, but just to, to mention that risk reduction can be measured by taking this approach. So the company effectively listed all the cleaning activities, they rated each program, they determined the probability of failure of the cleaning program, and then the severity of impact. And out of this came their measurement of risk. Here's an example. So for example, um, looking at species changeover uh, on a sausage line, they determined that to be high risk because of the risk of cross-contamination of the allergen or of species. And from that, they determined frequent cleaning with visual and ATP verification of the cleaning post um, at the end of the cleaning program. So a uh, summary of the outputs. Well, uh, the company in this case were able to identify in general that allergens are the greatest risk. And in particular, cleaning programs on lines uh, which, where there was a lot of changeovers between species and allergen containing products were the highest risk in particular. So they established the criteria for the programs based on that and focused their energies and their verification activities on those high-risk programs, including visual inspection, um, rapid testing, swabbing of the line, and very clear reclean criteria should there be a failure. All the other programs were, were, were given less attention and conducted less frequently. And the outcome was a very structured approach to risk assessment, which can be updated easily. Um, and then a significant reduction in the failures and the number of reclaims as well. Okay, so that, guys, that's just to, kind of, uh, to support the, 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 I suppose, the argument that a structured risk assessment, whether called for by BRC or not, is in fact a significant value-adding activity for any food company. Okay, so um, I think... Uh, to finish off on the final slide, guys, uh, it is a fact of life that risk assessment is uh, as a requirement growing, and I don't think that's going to change. I think we're going to see more and more dependency among the GFSI standards for risk assessments to be conducted. Uh, I think we hope in the future that the BRC and other uh, GFSI um, certification schemes will provide more guidance. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to uh, take some time, jump over to safefood360.com, click on our resource page, guys, and you'll be able to get your hands on those Excel tools. Uh, also, just to mention, we have a, a white paper specifically focused on the validation of cleaning programs, uh, which includes a risk assessment approach as well, and you may find that useful too. So, Simon, I think we're coming up to uh, 40 minutes so far. Um, I... I think we should hand back to you and uh, take whatever questions uh, the audience have at this stage. Okay, yeah, great. <coughs> Thanks very much, George. Um, <coughs> um, uh, during the whole... Uh, uh, my, my voice is coming out of your speakers, which is a bit disconcerting. I don't think you can turn the volume down. That's me, um, is it? Yeah. Um, okay, that's better. Okay, that's better. Right, so it, um, that, that's great. And uh, took us through that Excel there, through the uh, risk assessment methodology. But like you say, that's available as a down, download from your website. Yes. George. Right. Yeah. Okay. If you would like to put your questions in the sidebar, ladies and gents, then we'll pick our way through 
really long we've got about uh, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, okay okay Krastin is asking George would, would you conduct risk assessment on the supplier assessment program and I guess how, you know what sort of things would that look at maybe yes 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 would be the short answer in fact uh, one of the biggest changes in the brc uh, relates to supplier um, risk assessment and also if we look at fisma for the, those in the audience uh, from the us um, the new legislation there is very clear and and very tough in fact on uh, establishing verification programs for both domestic and foreign suppliers and the legislation clearly states that it has to be based upon risk as well. And more, more so, uh, it has to be based on a risk assessment of each individual material um, and not so much a category of materials as well. So the short answer is yes, absolutely. And in fact, um, you can pretty much accept that the risk assessment of suppliers and materials is a part of food safety now going forward. Okay, Brenda said the uh, excellent presentation cleared up how to risk assess a PRP, which obviously a lot of people have been uh, struggling with. Um, okay. Do you have an example, Sandra's asking, do you have an example of a risk assessment model for HACCP you can share? Um, the short, yes, of course, we, we do. I just don't have a prepared Simon for now, uh, but be more than happy to um, to send that on um, if she'd like, or if the person would like to provide her email address. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Barbara's asking, would this be uh, applicable to SQF as well? You know, the same uh, methodology. Yes. Yeah, I, I would suggest absolutely. Um, the GFSI standards in general uh, have moved towards what are called risk-based food safety programs. Um, now, if I, I I can't cite specifically the clauses in SQF right now, but um, I'm going to assume that because this company will be SQF certified, that they will be US-based, and even 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 aside SQF. FISMA requirements will require um, an approach like this. Okay, yeah. And um, yeah, Helene has just said how about the applicability of FISMA. So as you've just said, it does apply. Um, just, just that, yeah. So just on FISMA, Simon, um, just on FISMA, uh, the, the legislation calls for the, uh, the identification of preventative controls, what's called preventative controls. Um, again, if you read the fine prints in, in the, um, the rules for FISMA, it does state clearly that it should be based on an assessment of risk. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, Diane is asking, how about food defense? Is this also used, uh, for example, uh, to decide where is a restricted area? Could you use this to, to, to look at your plan um, and risk assess? <laughs> Yeah, um, not necessarily, I would say. Um, the FDA have developed and provided a standard model for developing food defense plans. Now, part of that is a vulnerability assessment, which does focus on each step of the process. And then there is a more generalized uh, mitigation plan for, for, the, for the facility. Um, so my advice in that case will be refer to the FDA's models on that. Um, they're more appropriate for doing a vulnerability assessment and food defense plan. Okay, thanks, George. Um, Kamuruddin is asking, does this also, also apply to BRC standard storage and distribution? Uh, I get, I get um, yeah, I'm going to have, a, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with the standard, guys, uh, but I would expect yes is the answer, I think. Okay. But I would, I would like to check it out. Um, to what extent that standard okay. causes yep. Right, uh, Rajesh is asking, how about the control of radiological hazards? Are there any specific guidelines that our suppliers need to follow to meet BRC as well as FISMA? Uh, 
So radi radiological hazards, I think, would be addressed uh, in the more traditional HACCP way, uh, similar to pathogens or physical or chemical hazards. Uh, so radiological hazards would be included in that. It's a more recent introduction and, and more so in the US um, under legislation that you need to include radiological hazards. As regards preventative control measures, I have to be honest and say I'm not entirely sure um, how you would approach that. It is an interesting question which I think would be worth looking at. Okay. Uh, Joanne is asking, seeing that you have a little extra time, can you please and the other standards that require risk assessments you haven't spoke, spoken on. Yeah. Okay. Is, is BRC, George, more um, sort of specific, you know, 97 times risk assessment is uh, referred to, as you said, in BRC 7 now. Um, SQF, uh, FSSC, IFS, are they, say, going down the same route? leaving it up to you to determine what level of controls you have, etc. Yeah. Important? Well, in, in regard to the other GFSI standards, they, they all, without exception, cite codex principles um, as being the basis of the food safety plan. Uh, so in that regard, yes, they do all require risk assessment. Now, when it comes to non-HACCP uh, systems and PRPs, again, it depends on the standards. So the IFS standard, I think, is probably pretty, pretty um, clear as well that they require risk assessments to be done for these. SQF, um, I'm less sure about, uh, but I suspect you know, there might be some experts in the audience there in SQF that there is a requirement for risk assessment. Um, definitely in terms of FISMA, which seems to be cutting across now, in fact, uh, most of the GFSI requirements for the US market are any company exporting its product to the US, it's a clear cut, absolutely yes, your preventative controls have to be based upon risk. Yeah. yeah. And, and do you um, yourself, um, do, do you, you know, think this is the right, the right way to do, to put the onus on the company to really think deeply about all the processes? Um, you know, is it, do you, are you an advocate of risk assessment? <laughs> Um, I am, in fact. I think I think risk assessment is is the appropriate tool for companies to use. Um, I think the difficulty arises is that the standards uh, introduce it and call for it. I think in some cases, without fully understanding what it is they're asking the, the practi practitioners yeah. to do, I think this is the difficulty. Yes. Risk assessment as a, a tool as a model is actually quite simple, but we don't have any clear models for doing this. There's a lot of different models out there. And, um, but I am an advocate, I think, I mean, the question is how else can you determine the appropriateness of any control measure you have in place unless you understand the risk? Um, yeah. So. Okay, uh, a lot of people are asking for a copy of risk assessment for HACCP. So obviously risk assessment for PRPs, but also people are asking for risk assessment for HACCP. Somebody also asked specific to Safe Food 360. Does 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 your system include uh, this uh, type of risk assessment modeling, or is that some part of your system, Safe Food 360? Uh, yep. I mean, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that question directly with the person um, if they want to. Uh, yeah. Or I can do it now. I'm I'm conscious I'm not selling our products. No, um, sure. Mm -hmm. So you can give a quick, uh, you can give a quick uh, answer. That's yes, no problem. Yes, it's a short answer. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Syed saying, I think everybody has to prepare a model for risk assessment based on their own circumstances. Yeah, I think that's Correct. right. But but sometimes you're saying that sort of maybe the people who write these standards are sort of just saying throwing that, you know, do a risk assessment at everything rather than um, thinking a bit more about it themselves. Uh, Asanja, I'm currently putting in place a HACCP plan. Uh, da, da, da. Lots of people putting their emails. There's no need to put your emails in, ladies and gents, because uh, after the webinar, we'll be sending an email to you all with uh, the slides, the recording, and also linked directly to 
the resources that George has uh, spoken about, such as the um, uh, risk assessment cell uh, and also the white papers, etc. Uh, risk assessments and under BRC related to the topic. Uh, while we've still got George, we've still got 10 minutes. We're on BRC 7 now. Uh, and do you know what, when the next version is, is on? Uh, uh, I don't know the exact date, Simon, but I understand it's a two year cycle. It's yeah, a two year cycle. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess uh, all the GFSI standards will be looking to include elements of FISMA? I think so. Um, well, all standards would uh, state that you must comply with the local legislation anyway, so yeah. that's a catch-all requirement. Uh, but I, I would suspect that the GFSI standards will be very busy uh, incorporating FISMA into their standards because in many cases it exceeds their own requirements which traditionally hasn't been the way. Uh, GFSI has always been the, the, has set the bar high relative to legislation. Uh, it appears that's now slightly inverted. So yes, I'm sure they will. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think we're getting uh, any more questions. I don't know if it's the, the, uh, the sidebar's broken, which uh, has happened uh, before today. Um, so we'll just give it an, an, another Another minute. Anybody with a specific question rather than a, a request for a HACCP plan or something like that? Um, if not, what we can do, obviously, I'll pick through. There was questions that have sort of probably about six foot underground now. They, it, it moves that quick. So we can always pick through them up. And uh, if there's anything in there pertinent to the webinar, we can send them to George and hopefully you'll maybe answer those by email later. Okay. Okay. Can you see any more questions after Putin? We've even got, uh, I know we had a lot of uh, attendees today, but even uh, uh, Putin uh, is uh, joined us today. That's the last one I've got. Hi, George. Thanks. The last one. Yeah, I'm just looking here as well. Um, Can you see any? Okay. So, all right. Yeah. I think we probably covered most of the questions. I'm just reading down through them here. Yeah. I mean, I think um, it, it, it's obviously um, when people see the resources that you've got and download them and, and the presentation sinks in and perhaps they watch back, they probably have more questions about uh, how they can apply it to their business. And if you do that, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to go to the IFSQN uh, forum, start a topic. Um, I mean, we can even start a topic specific uh, to the, we, in fact, we have got a topic specific to this webinar, so uh, we can carry on the dialogue on there. Um, okay, I think what we'll do there, George, um, we'll leave it, um, we did the 40 minutes, we've had some questions and I think that's very valuable, so uh, on behalf of all the attendees today, and also uh, this is recorded, there'll be thousands of people watch that in the future, thanks uh, for everybody in the future. We've got another question there, further to radiological hazards, what are some of the examples of these hazards seen in the food industry? Uh, anything on that, George, before we go? It's a very general question, um, Simon. Um, okay. You simply wouldn't have time to go through all the different types of potential no. hazards. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much, George, on behalf of the IFS and myself and all the attendees. And, uh, no, thanks, Simon. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate the invitation. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. All right, ladies and gents, uh, an excellent uh, session today. I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, the only thing left to do is obviously to deliver your certificate. Um, when you click on the link here, you'll be taken to the uh, IFS Green website, and then there's a link to Dropbox. Uh, with 2,000 people registering, I can't personalize the uh, the certificate so what you need to do is either print and sign it yourself or bring it into a graphics package and type your name but uh, that's there for you in the sidebar as i said we've got the how to become a food fraud detective and that was on the 4th of november so look forward to seeing you on that one uh, 
And yeah, as I say every week, uh, it's been a, a, a great session. Friday's the best day of the week. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and have a lovely weekend and we'll see you soon. Take care.